Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Today, I have Ziad El Nabolsi. Um, you know, for folks who have followed, especially the audio podcast, we had a recent conversation. Well, <laughs> it was a conversation we did in August that recently got published uh, on East African Marxism, Marxism, Leninism. Um, that was a really, you know, interesting discussion. I definitely encourage folks to check that out. Um, I believe it's also in the show description, as is um, Ziad's uh, Phil Papers page, which is where he hosts all of the academic work that he does in collections and journals, et cetera. So people can get um, free free PDF copies of these discussions. And so today we're going to kind of talk about um, we're going to talk about philosophy. Um, we're going to talk about that in relation to Edward Said, and then also a piece that Ziad co-authored um, that's about um, Hegel and Islam, which, you know, might seem kind of fringe to some folks, but I think given how foundational Hegel is to Western philosophy as well as to Marxism, um, you know, it's, a, it's an important kind of conversation that's being had there that raises, I think, some, you know, interesting points, especially as um, they move in the piece to, you know, kind of a conclusion and, and sort of what do we, how do we, how do we deal with this sort of uh, impasse or problem, you know? And so um, anyway, I'm excited to get into this conversation. Um, Sina, welcome. Sina, we're working on uh, the microphone that you shared with Ziad. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, yeah, Ziad, welcome to the stage. Uh, thank you so much, Jared, for uh, having me and for this uh, generous introduction. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and thank you, Sina, for uh, the microphone. <laughs> right on. And folks tuning in from Egypt, too. That's great. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, to kind of get it started, we'll start with Edward Said. And I, I, I think for a lot of our listeners, that's probably someone that they're more interested in than than Hegel to some degree. Although, as I said already, I think Hegel is um, important, if only because of like his influence and his, uh, you know, he lays a lot of foundations that other important work is built upon. Um, and so, you know, Said, you know, we know him as kind of a, a literary scholar, a literary cr critic, you know, um, he's obviously most well known for his work, Orientalism, also for culture and imperialism. Um, you know, actually, we did a, a conversation with Sina, um, I think in 2020, or yeah, I think it was 2020, um, right after the assassination of uh, Qasem Soleimani. Um, and, uh, we talked a little bit about Orientalism and in that moment and a little bit of Edward Said's work and history there. Um, you know, but anyway, as, as we're kind of um, reviewing this discussion, this, this piece that you wrote, it, it's a review, right. Of a, of someone's book on Said, like a, a this kind of biography. Um, and so maybe you could start just kind of laying out some of the issues you found reading this book that led you wanting to write a piece about it and think about Edward Said's relationship to philosophy. Uh, good. Yeah. So, so that piece that you're referencing, so it's actually part of a book forum. Um, uh, so I was invited to contribute to this book forum. So, so in that case, it's it's not really a review. It's more of a response, right? So you pick up a strand and respond uh, to the contents of the book. Uh, so this is Timothy uh, 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 Brennan's uh, kind of intellectual biography of Said, which got actually a lot of coverage in various news media outlets. Uh, I think Al Jazeera ran some coverage of it, uh, the New York Times and so on. Um, uh, the Boston Review, I think, also had had a piece on it. So, so it did get some, uh, you know, quite a bit of coverage. Uh, uh, a substantial portion of it was quite critical for different reasons. So, for example, some people uh, uh, thought that Brennan did not sufficiently emphasize Said's political engagements. Uh, uh, for example, in the Palestinian Legislative Council and so on. Um, uh, and, you know, f my piece was really thinking of it in terms of what I know, what I do, which is philosophy and trying to uh, 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 think about 
um, Edward Said as a philosopher or as somebody who at least takes you know ex- explicitly philosophical positions uh, and maybe relating that to his politics as well uh, to the extent that's possible uh, maybe showing some incongruities between his theoretical uh, beliefs or positions and uh, his substantive or concrete political engagements um, so so one really interesting thing about the Brennan intellectual biography of Said uh, is he really does try to emphasize the various philosophical influences on Said. So he talks about Vico's new science, which, which Said talks a, uh, quite a bit a lot, uh, about. He talks about Said reading uh, a lot of the Hegelian Marxists, who, who I talk a little bit about in the piece. Um, uh, so people like Lukash, uh, Georg Lukash, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, I wanted to also kind of translate the language of literary theory, right? So this term theory gets used a lot in literary criticism to translate it into terms that would be understandable to philosophers. So I was also trying to address kind of my colleagues in philosophy. Um, so you'll see me, uh, I mean, it, it might be a bit boring or, or kind of pedestrian, but trying to translate the language of theory about representation and so on to, to language uh, that's understandable or graspable by many uh, academic philosophers. So that was my entry point, really. Uh, and I mean, I think it's a very interesting book. Uh, of course, I have some criticisms of it. And uh, I should say, too, that Timothy Brennan responded to my criticisms and to the criticisms made by others in that book forum so maybe when we put up links we can also put his response i think that would be fair right to uh make that accessible as well yeah that's that's great um and we will do that um so one of the things that you're looking at which i this is really interesting to me on some level is like um thinking about Said in relation to postmodernism, um, you know, he arrives in the, in academia at a time when these trends are really kind of taking off, you know, Foucault, post-structuralism and so on. And this stuff has a tremendous impact. I mean, it, ha- it still has this huge influence over Western academia in so many disciplines, you know, today. Um, so firstly, can you kind of talk about that influence and where people might see some of that crossover into Saeed's work um, and where you think Saeed's work differs from some of these thinkers, if that's even a reasonable way to kind of pose it. Um, Some of this, uh, you know, as you're talking about in the piece seems to have to do, you know, with the concept of truth. You know, you there's a quote that you write, uh, it is not difficult to see how someone like Said, who devoted himself to pointing out contradictions between Zionist narratives and facts, would have held some version of correspondence theory to truth. You can explain what correspondence theory is for our audience, but like that, of course, makes a lot of sense given, especially as what we're seeing right now. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, so, so, so. It- in that kind of literary theory milieu of the 1970s, uh, 1980s, and so on, uh, as Brennan points out and really draws it out quite explicitly, uh, Said actually plays a very important role in introducing some of these ideas to Western academia. Uh, so, uh, um, for instance, uh, quite a lot of debates about interpretation, this stuff about textuality, which sometimes, and I think that's not in Said, but sometimes it it uh, it went to kind of extremes where everything is uh, is textual, everything is open to interpretation, um, and uh, you know it's almost that we cannot then point beyond the textual to some some correspondence or even lack of correspondence to something that's not textual, that's, you know, an object, uh, even a social construct that's uh, pivoted around objects in the real world. I mean, you could talk about, you know, for example, a border that takes uh, uh, a natural land, uh, a natural feature of geography, like a river. A lot of borders are around rivers that makes sense they're defensible and so on so so these are all natural features and of course there is a social construction kind of on top of that uh but there is still a river with river banks and so on 
the social construction part, for instance, would come that, well, if you cross this river and you have the wrong piece of paper on you, you'll get a bullet in your head. Again, that's very material, you know, a bullet going through your brain. So, so the interaction between the two, right? And it's not that we would have to say, no, I mean, there is no uh, social construction going on or something like that. But, you know, it, it is... Um, it is based on or built on something that exists independently of the act of social construction. Um, and, you know, some of the criticisms, of course, uh, of uh, this kind of movement towards postmodernism was that, you know, it involved abandoning any serious talk about truth and specifically thinking of truth as, you know, so if I tell you that something is true, a proposition is true, a statement, uh, um, is true um, on one very common construal. Uh, it's true because it somehow corresponds to facts in the world. And of course, philosophers have had a lot of uh, discussions and debates about what exactly correspondence is supposed to be. Um, you know, how could uh, a linguistic entity, or even if, you know, some people think of propositions as almost Platonic forms. You know, and that get instantiated in in uh, utterances. Um, how could these things relate to facts? And also, what are facts? Are facts material objects? I mean, that's not really, that doesn't seem right. So there are all of these problems with the correspondence theory of truth, but it's still kind of the common sense, uh, if you will, uh, version of truth. I think when most people speak of truth, they mean something like that. Of course, there are competitors. So some people would say uh, truth can be um, articulated or understood in terms of coherence. So um, now you're not referring to something external to the set of statements, but you're trying to look at whether the statements cohere logically uh, if there's contradiction or absence of contradiction between them. But of course, one problem with that is, for example, take this case of uh, 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 um, Said's criticism of the Zionist narrative, which I think shows that he can be a coherent theorist of truth. Uh, because you could say, in many ways, it is conceivable to have this um, Zionist narrative about conquest and so on that's coherent, right? I mean, you could be somebody who really believes, you know, uh, either that there were no Palestinians or that they had no right to self-determination at all and start from there and come up with a coherent account. But intuitively, it seems somebody like Said would want to say, well, wait, this is nonsense. I mean, there is such a thing as historical facts that are independent of... Uh, uh, any particular theoretical um, commitment. So in that sense, I think Saeed is somebody who plays a role in bringing over a lot of postmodernist and post-structuralist ideas, um, but also keeps some kind of distance uh, from them. Whereas I think what, what often happens is people have collapsed this uh, the role of Saeed as a transmitter of these ideas, uh, and the question of the extent to which he was committed to them, because of course you can transmit a view without being committed to it. You could find it interesting, even you know you don't really want to subscribe to it. Um, but you know the fact that you're transmitting it and seriously engaging with it doesn't mean that uh, that you subscribe to it. So, so that that's uh, kind of bare bones response. Of course, happy to elaborate. No, I appreciate that, and I think you know. That part of the text just stood out to me, you know, in terms of like, it reminds me in some ways of the conversations that were happening around Trump at a certain point when, you know, he would say, altern you know, there was the discussion of alternative facts and like, you know, this like, you know, and pe some people were like, well, Trump, the Trump administration is a postmodernist administration, you know, it doesn't actually... It's, you know, it's able to create its own narratives and its reality. I mean, I would argue that that's what U.S. presidents do in general all the time. And I think that right now, you know, we see a very clear example of that where, you know, there's reporters coming and saying, like, you know, what do you think about this war crime that just happened? And they're like, well, you know, we haven't we haven't been able to determine that anything has happened, you know, and, and so there's this way that it becomes as long as you adhere to your narratives, right? Like you, you create your own version of, of truth, essentially that starts to become adopted by the media and, and regular people. Right. But at the same time, it isn't again, like corresponding to 
facts on the ground, however we might think mm -hmm. about that, you know? Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, so there's another piece in this where, um, yeah, so one of the things you're also thinking about too is this field like of literary theory, you know, and the relationship you know how to how to think about it even philosophically as a whole kind of um field of academia i guess or of of research and thought and that um in one like more explicitly like its relationship to something like marxism right which takes a you know a foundation within the kind of material world material conditions producing you know certain phenomena in terms of ideas etc and um that's a very bad, vulgar description of Marxism, but I'll, I'll start there. Um, uh, but, you know, whereas in literary theory and literary criticism, you're, you're really focusing often on the realm of ideas and on the way that, you know, these ideas, these forms of representation and discourses have an impact on the social world. Um, and so, you know, if we think about Orientalism in this, in this case, like we could think about how the Orientalist ideas of the imperialists, um, you know, end up being, you know, sort of enacted upon people that live in these spaces called the Orient, right? Um, that would be kind of a, I guess, a, a more of a, a literary theory version of it. So anyways, the question that it raised in a little bit that I thought was an interesting one was whether Marxism is something that is really um, can kind of cohabitate or be coherent within literary theory um, because of its focus on the primacy of ideas. Um, and I think that's something that you're kind of engaging with. So if you could just say a little bit about this discussion that I haven't laid out very well and, and what you're thinking about within it. No, no, uh, no, I, I think you've, you've posed it uh, really well. I mean, I think one difficulty is, so, so let's start here. Let's start, uh, you know, let's go back to the mid nineteenth century uh, uh, to the uh, to the German ideology to 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 uh, Marx and Engels's German ideologies. So one interesting thing is to understand well who are they critiquing and on what grounds are they critiquing the people they're critiquing. So they're critiquing uh, 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 the so-called left or young Hegelians. I mean, actually, some of the young Hegelians were right wing. Some of the old Hegelians were left wing. But anyway, that, that's that's how uh, people talk about it. Um, but they're critiquing them because they have this idea that, well, and you see it in Hegel as well. I think I have that quotation from uh, Hegel in, in the paper, if I recall, that, well, you could say that there is something uh, not right with uh, uh, the social world as it is or something like that uh, and that what we need to do to set it right is to critique the representations which are responsible, the, uh, the mental representations which are responsible for um, uh, for the state of affairs which we don't like which we don't think is appropriate and so on um, and What's remarkable, I think, about Marx and Engels' critique uh, in the German ideology is they're critical of this. They think this is uh, this is actually uh, inadequate as a response. Why? And the question is, well, why do they think that? And the answer would be, well, they think those people, their opponents, uh, so people like Bruno Bauer, for example, they think that those people overestimate uh, the causal premise or uh, or causal potence of ideas. Now, once you really think seriously about this, it becomes uh, quite clear that there's a problem. I mean, it's a problem for everybody who defines themselves as an intellectual, whether they work in a university setting or not. So if I take this idea seriously, this thesis seriously, uh, what am I doing? What's, what's the relationship between uh, let's say if somebody's convinced by uh, uh, this Marxist materialist theory of history, um, uh, the question becomes, well, you can't just carry on uh, like other people who have been launching critiques carried on. So it's not that, you know, social critique is not some newfangled idea uh, 
uh, you see it in you know classical kind of 18th century enlightenment philosophy so voltaire and the critique of the catholic church uh, the critique of uh, vestiges of feudalism in french uh, 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 legal systems you see it in the work of people like diderot uh, although for example diderot is interesting because he always had a kind of special place uh, in Marxist histories of philosophy because Voltaire was seen as a kind of proto, you know, as a materialist in the metaphysical sense, uh, but also as almost a proto historical materialist. So he sometimes says things, Well, hey, do you want to know why our critiques against slavery are not efficacious? Well, because nobody's really moved uh, by the plight of people. Uh, uh, on whose subjugation they depend on to get cheap commodities like sugar. That's his example. So, so you can kind of see, right, these uh, uh, this kind of proto-historical materialism a bit in Diderot. Uh, and that's why, for example, in the Soviet Union, he had the kind of, uh, uh, how should we put it, a glorified place, uh, placed on a kind of pedestal, him and Spinoza, right, the two kind of pre-Marxist philosophers who get a lot of... Uh, uh, credit or recognition in, in some circles. Uh, uh. So so you could see then, to come back to the question about literary theory, uh, you could see that there is a problem. If I think that, wait, ideas are not the kind of motor of history, but something like, you know, for example, on one, the kind of technological determinist reading of historical materialism, it's, you know, the development of productive forces, which then come in conflict with the relations of production, so uh, property relations and so on, and then uh, uh, essentially uh, we get a transformation of these relations of production so that uh, they cohere or uh, are better able to actualize the productive potential of these new productive forces. So that's, that's kind of the you know, you could call it economistic or technological determinist reading of historical materialism. But even on the alternative, uh, if you're talking about, you know, uh, class struggle as the motor of history, so famously in the, uh, uh, you know, opening lines of the Communist Manifesto, the history of uh, all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. Again, of course, there is a way in which it would be mediated through a struggle in the intellectual field, but, you know, uh, Marx, for example, thinks that, no, there is something about uh, power based on economic resources, power based on uh, the ability to make people do what you want them to do, even if they don't want to do it, which is a kind of very material power that's decisive. So the question becomes, well, wait, what's the role of ideas here? Um, and, and yet, of course... Uh, there is no easy answer in the sense that Marx spent all of his life writing, <laughs> writing critiques of various, whether various other leftist projects like his critique of Proudhon or, or, or of course, his critique of uh, 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 the classical political economist Smith, Ricardo, uh, and William Petty to go uh, back earlier. So, so you can see the kind of difficulties that are uh, arising given this problematic and perhaps difficulties that are not faced by uh, other intellectual streams because if you think you know if, if you don't think that uh, ideas don't have causal premise when it comes to explaining so social change you don't really have that problem you can just say you know what i'm changing the world by writing a book critical of foucault or something uh i think as 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 um, somebody you know anybody who who uh, purports to adhere to historical materialism they can't seriously say that Right, you can't just say, "Well, there was this idea; it ruined everything." I'm gonna write a devastating uh, takedown of it. So, so, um, so that's I think where the complication arises. Sorry, that was very long-winded. Uh, no, that was great. I, could you bring it back a little bit to Saeed's work <laughs> and just connect it to like how you know we might think about his work in um, Orientalism, culture, and imperialism? How you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's take. I mean, let's take Orientalism for instance, this text. So, in part, of course, Said is thinking about the fate of his homeland. So, he's, uh, I mean, when, when does Orientalism come out? 78, I think. Uh, I don't know uh, off the top of my head. So, <clears throat> you're talking 30 years after the Nagba, roughly three decades, uh, maybe a bit more, a bit less. Um, so... 70, 78, you were right. Oh, okay, okay, good, good. So, 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 of course, he's 
concerned with the fate of his homeland. He wants to do something to uh, uh, alleviate, you know, well, this condition of occupation. But, you know, of course, as a professional literary critic, what are his tools? His tools are the examination of texts. And also he has this very, which I think is very uh, interesting and largely correct approach to to uh, uh, literary uh, criticism, which is a very kind of historicist approach, taking uh, the text in its historical context, trying to understand the various influences on the author, uh, the intended audience of the author, the differences between the author's intention and the actual meaning of the text and all of that stuff. I think it's, it's quite interesting and essentially, I think, right as a way to interpret texts. But there is this aspect of, well, how do we explain? Uh, so if our question is, how do we explain uh, the domination and the successful domination, right? It has to be said that it's been successful of West, uh, the domination by Western Europe of uh, the part that we uh, refer to today as the Middle East, because of course, I doesn't talk about the Orient in general. He doesn't talk about uh, Orientalism as it applies to China, for example. Uh, uh, it doesn't talk about India that much, as far as I can tell. It doesn't talk about Japan and so on. So, so, so I mean, it's a kind of limited sphere of the Orient. Uh, he's really interested. I mean, he his account really actually just focuses on Egypt and you know Bilad Shem, you know Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, uh, uh, parts of Iraq, that area. Um, and so one of the things he's doing is trying to see the extent to which um, certain representations, which are really, I think, it's very clear he thinks that they are misrepresentations, systematic misrepresentations of the social, intellectual, uh, economic, political uh, reality of the Middle East, how these misrepresentations provided the fuel, as it were. Um, so, and here it's is where it becomes, you know, interesting and complicated. So one way you could say is they provided justification for the conquest of this uh, area and for the means by which this conquest is affected. Because if you go in, as, for example, the French did in Algeria uh, uh, when they first conquered it, and then in response to resistance, I mean, they, they, in, in some cases, they eliminated entire tribes, entire, uh, uh, you know, was clearly genocidal in character. Um, so you have to provide some justification for this, especially given that, you know, this is France, even if it's, if it's a, a kind of reactionary France, but it's a France that has lived through the French Revolution with all of these ideals uh, of uh, equality, uh, fraternity, uh, liberty, and so on. So uh, uh, you have to justify why these people uh, shouldn't be treated as humans, because now even the category of human being uh, becomes imbued with uh, or kind of... Uh, imbued with a set of values that perhaps it didn't have before, right? You have the very famous Declaration of the Rights of Man. It's not the Declaration of the Rights of Frenchmen or something. It might be, you know, men in a kind of gendered way, uh, although, of course, there is a lot of debate amongst intellectual historians there. Um, so one way is to say, well, these people are radically different fro from us. Uh, they don't respond to the things that we uh, respond to in the same way. Um, and to create this distance, and then perhaps that's a way to justify this, you know, genocidal violence against them. Um, maybe things like, you know, uh, one right common Orientalist trope is to say, well, you know, of course, look, we kind of massacred people in this village or uh, this town. You might think that this is really bad, but those people don't really value life that much. So, uh, actually don't really don't think about it in these terms right that's a classic one i mean that that goes all the way through to the vietnam war to what's happening today uh, uh in gaza right so 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 that's a classic way to to justify that now if we're talking about justification that's fine you could say well from a historical materialist point of view for instance you still need justifications you need to provide justifications both for others and for yourself because that stuff i mean it's uh, it damages your psyche, of course, if you're a normal human being, and most human beings are normal human beings. Um, but the problem is, and I think this is, this is you know, to bring it back very concretely to, to the book Orientalism itself and its reception, for instance, in the Arab world, the problem is Said sometimes speaks as if 
uh, this is what motivated uh, or this is what caused, you know, let's talk about causation. This is what caused the, the conquest uh, of the Orient by the Occident. And now you can see, to bring it back to what we were talking about earlier, from a historical materialist standpoint, that can't be the case, right? That would be, you'd be abandoning that theoretical paradigm if these misrepresentations by themselves are sufficient to explain or play the most significant role in the explanatory account of why and how uh, this conquest of uh, the Middle East happened. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, and you would, so you would need to find a justification within the material world, right? That then the ideas become, you know, important to and they both can play roles but yeah yeah it's the question of sort of whether the ideas are prime you know whether they hold primacy in that discussion yeah um so let's switch to hegel um so this is a you know a, a, again it's is a, a little bit lengthier piece you co-authored it so there's also a, a co-author of this piece and you can say a little bit about that i'm sure um so so sorry um so first, I would love it if you would say, just lay out for our audience kind of the key thrust of what you're both looking at in this piece, what you think are some of the concerns or implications. Um, in other words, some people might say at the outset, you know, why should we care what Hegel thinks? And, you know, that he had, I mean, first of all, like a lot of people have pointed out a lot of blind spots over the years that Hegel had. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, there's a lot of criticism around the way Hegel looked at Africans, for instance, and, and you know, slavery and things like that as well. Um, and so, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be that surprising that he would also have a blind spot to, you know, with regard to Islam. Um, obviously, you do think it's important to examine Hegel's thinking here or lack of thinking around Islam and that it does have broader implications. So let's start there with what you're, you know, what you're examining and why you felt this was an important thing to dig into. Uh, good. Uh, yeah. So, so okay. So let me start out with a disclaimer. So uh, my co-author, uh, Amir Yagid, uh, is not responsible for anything that I'm saying here. This is, this is kind of my account of uh, my contribution to uh, the paper. Of course, you know, there are lots of points of agreement. Otherwise, we would not have been able to co-author uh, the article. That's obvious. But, you know, I just want to, to uh, put out that disclaimer. And really, I mean, if, if people... Um, uh, uh, look at the text itself, uh, which I'm sure we'll be able to post a link to. Uh, it's it's um, so the text is about you know 26 pages or something. Uh, so we basically each primarily wrote one half of it, and then we worked together to kind of make them cohere. Uh, I think we agree. I think on uh, the, the the general points that are there, but I wrote the second half specifically about. Uh, Hegel's um, uh, account, or rather lack of an account of the history of uh, uh, Islamic uh, science and philosophy in you know, the development of geist or spirit or mind, however you wish to translate that word. Uh, and also then, you know, for me, uh, most interestingly, that's what I'm really interested in, is the reception of Hegel in the Arab world, uh, specifically by Arab Muslim philosophers who had a specific stake different from Arab Christian philosophers, for instance. Um, but to go back to the question of motivation, uh, well, one really, uh, I think, salient thing when you think about Hegel and maybe even his global reception is um, Hegel is often taken... So, so in the Arab world, for example, uh, the reception of Hegel went by way of actually walking back in many cases from Marx. So people got interested in Marx and then they saw, they saw well, there is this kind of Hegelian strand. Uh, there is a, a Marxist a critique of Hegel. So they started kind of backwards, went backwards. Um, but also, even people who had no interested, uh, interest in Marx uh, found Hegel very interesting because one big question in... Uh, uh, Arabic speaking philosophy in the late 19th century. So, of course, in response partly to this wave of conquest. So, first, uh, you have, of course, you know, the first thing that happens is, you know, that very salient thing that happens, I suppose, is Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Uh, uh, I think he was consul at that time. Um, 
Council of the French Republic. Uh, so, so that's often seen as a kind of pivotal moment uh, where uh, Arabic-speaking intellectuals discover, you know, so so the classical account goes discover uh, the relative weakness vis-a-vis Europeans. Uh, you know, especially, of course, in military terms, uh, in terms of social organization and so on. Um, but anyway, so this this realization then kicks in that, you know, the Arabic speaking world has, um, to put it in very vulgar uh, uh, terms, fallen behind. So this becomes uh, something that really animates uh, Arabic philosophers, uh, Arabic speaking philosophers, and then there is this question of what they call then hadetha, modernity, and its relationship to, you know, their cultural inherited uh, inheritance. So turath, turath is a kind of, you know, intellectual tradition, uh, whether religious or even uh, philosophical and so on. And there is, a, there is a question of, well, what do we need to do in order to catch up to no longer be in this position of subordination? And Hegel then gets picked out especially in the 20th century, kind of, uh, uh, especially after the mid-20th century, as the paradigmatic philosopher of modernity. That, okay, if we want to grasp w- what this modernity thing is, we need some uh, exemplar. Uh, um, we need somebody who has explicitly uh, spoke about modernity as such. So Hegel, So Hegel famously is one of the kind of philosophers who talks about modernity from a philosophical standpoint, who has this kind of historical awareness that there's this new epoch that has these uh, set of normative principles that are supposed to structure life in it, and that it constitutes a radical break with what has happened in the past, um, a radical break with the history, uh, with the previous history of Europe, uh, and so on. So, so Hegel is seen as somebody you could, you know, uh, understand modernity and potential conflicts and uh, other relations between modernity and, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, indigenous or endogenous intellectual, uh, uh, an indigenous or in, uh, in, uh, endogenous intellectual heritage uh, through Hegel. So, so that's one motivation for really kind of fixating on Hegel. Um, of course, the other motivation is, like you said earlier, I think, you know, in, in the introduction uh, to this discussion is that Hegel is is really uh, tremendously influential, you know, in Europe, outside Europe. So, for example, to take his lectures on uh, the philosophy of religion, which is the set of lectures that we focused on, um, Hegel makes this distinction between magic and religion which becomes really important in anthropology. And now I don't want to make a claim that he originated this distinction because I don't really know. Uh, But this distinction, which is very clearly articulated in Hegel, becomes very important in subsequent 19th century anthropology. So the basic distinction is in magical practices, there is this question of, uh, sorry, there is this element of compulsion. So for example, if I'm telling you, hey, here's the spell, or this ritual that you do, if you do this, rain will fall, right? So it's mechanical. Uh, If I do the ritual correctly, the intended effect will follow. Now, religion operates, according to Hegel, very differently, and according to anthropologists who are influenced by him. Because in religion, I could pray for rain and pray correctly. I could do all the rituals correctly, but I cannot compel God to make it rain. So there is a very important distinction between the two. So so that's just one example of the kind of influence uh, he has. Uh, I could rant a lot about Hegel, so I'm going to stop here and let you, you know, uh, direct me, heard me in the correct direction. Yeah, right on. Well, let's keep going with the questions and then, you know, we'll, we'll get there along the way. So, you know, one of the things, and this is your co-author who points this out, I guess, because it's in the first half of the section, but um, first half of the piece, but you know, Hegel, uh, there's this question of whether Hegel views Islam as a determinant religion. And first of all, I was just was hoping that you could explain what that even means, because I didn't really know. And and why uh, why he doesn't see Islam that way, at least as you understand it. And, you know, what might be some of the the reasons why and also the implications of that? Right. OK, so so very basic uh, and very basic terms uh 
Hegel thinks of determinate religions as particular religions that have some conception of the divine and some conception of you know human beings and consequently based on these two conceptions uh, conceptions some account of the configuration of the relationship between the divine and the human uh, so so to give you an example uh, so for example he talks about what he calls uh, natural religions which he uses to refer to kind of uh, what he takes to be uh, traditional, quote-unquote, uh, African religions, which are, according to him, magical in character in the sense that I just described. Um, but then he also uses it to give us a kind of historical account where there is a progression. So in each, according to Hegel, uh, uh, in each form of determinate re religion, there is a conception of the divine. So, for example, uh, God as you know, just one abstract thing. This is what he thinks of when he thinks about what he calls Hindu religion. So he, he's talking about Brahman, everything is in Brahman, but 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 this universal kind of all-encompassing substance basically leads to the annihilation of these particular things. So there is no adequate account of the relationship between the divine substance uh, and particulars. Uh, and then in other cases, he gives you a historical narrative where there is progression. So, for example, uh, ancient Egyptian religion, according to Hegel, is a religion where there is some recognition of the special place of uh, the fact of mindedness, of having a mind, uh, you know, of of, uh, uh, um, uh, of 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 Geist as mind or spirit. Uh, but again, it's still not disentangled adequately from nature and Hegel's uh, evidence for this is he says well look look at the way that the ancient Egyptians conceived of their gods they still couldn't conceive of them for example as fully human uh, so for instance Horus has the head of uh, a hawk uh, um, uh, Hathor has the head of well not the head she has horns so associated with cows and so on so, so there is this kind of entanglement and then you're supposed to get the separation uh, in ancient Greek religion where there is a recognition of uh, the adequacy of the human bodily form as a vessel for uh, rationality or for mind. So uh, the idea here, for instance, is that in ancient Greek religion, the gods are depicted as humans. It's, it's an anthropomorphic, purely kind of anthropomorphic religion, at least according to him. Um, and then you get then a kind of transcendence uh, whereby the intellectual element, the spiritual element, transcends the natural in Judaism, for instance. So then there is a God who dominates the material world, creates it, and so on, and is transcendent. Uh, so in each case, there is supposed to be an inadequacy that, could, that will be uh, a motivation for abandoning that religion and uh, developing a more adequate conception of the divine and the human until of course you get to what he calls the consummate religion so so that's the end of the series you know when you then transition to the consummate religion which is christianity and more specifically for hegel protestant christianity now one interesting thing is that in the historical narrative such as it is and there is a debate about the temporal order that hegel uh, proceeds in and whether he really cares about the temporal order um but in the historical, you know, in the historical narrative, there is no reference to Islam. So, or when there is a reference to Islam, it's kind of in passing and just saying, well, look, this really looks like Judaism. So actually Hegel draws this connection between Judaism and Islam really tightly. Um, and according to Hegel, Islam doesn't basically have any new intellectual content. It's just a... a, a a recapitulation of Judaism, so this abstract God uh, who, well, real God, not abstract as in not real, but totally transcendent. Uh, so in relation to this God, nothing particular, no so existing social institution or anything like that has any significance. And the only relationship of uh, any consequence that could take place between a, a finite human being and this uh, uh, transcendent God is one of total submission. So in Judaism, he thinks that this, for Hegel thinks it happens to, through uh, blind or, or unthinking obedience to ritual laws. So he thinks something similar happens to Islam, but Islam is more dangerous for Hegel because in addition to that kind of blind submission, 
it has an injunction to convert people. So it's a, so he calls it a kind of fanaticism of expansion or conversion. Uh, so both Judaism and Islam are, are uh, fanatical religions, according to Hegel. But one of them is more dangerous than the other because it's tethered to this injunction to convert and to expand and so on. Whereas according to him, Judaism is not. Um, so that's why, you know, Islam doesn't really have a place. It's just a recapitulation. There is no uh, new content, new, no intellectual problem that it comes to solve, basically. It's just a political threat. It's a geopolitical fact that Europeans have to deal with. But, they, but there's nothing to engage with intellectually. Mm. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of points that you seem to look into in some specificity, you know, one, you know, would be, um, you know, these implications, of course, of Hegel and, and on European philosophy by just what you said, there's nothing to engage with here intellectually within Islam. Um, another would be sort of whether Islamic societies have space for like civil institutions and laws that are outside the framework of Islam and are not totally determined by Islam, right? So this, I guess, would be the distinction between some folks who say, you know, within Islamic societies, everything follows like Sharia, you know, um, versus like, is there some, uh, you know, in the in the West, we like to talk about secular institutions, et cetera, and things like that. So, um you know, maybe it's more accurate to make this distinction between kind of laws of the world, right? Laws that govern a society versus divine laws. Um, and so anyways, uh, clarify kind of what I'm laying out here and, and what you're looking at in this section. Right, right. So, so in that section, I'm interested in a question, which is whether it is a clear cut matter that there is no room for uh, laws or prescriptions that... Uh, that come from or accord with um, the kind of uh, secular needs of a given community. Uh, so Hegel doesn't seem to think that there's a place for that in Islam. And I was just simply pointing out that it's it's a bit hard to... I mean, th the thing about, you know, religions, why in part they survive, right, is their flexibility, right? Uh, um, and, and that flexibility has to be translated into some leeway when it comes to how people actually organize their life. Because if a religion was totally tethered to, for example, to bring it back to the historical materialist stuff we were talking about, to a specific mode of production, and that society abandons that mode of production, then it would seem to have to abandon that religion. But it, historically, we know that's not the case. So there has to be some leeway. And I was just pointing out to some elements in uh, the Islamic intellectual tradition, where it's pretty clear that at least it's not a closed matter in the sense. F so, for example, I, I quote um, uh, a very famous Malki jurist, uh, Al Qadi uh, Ayyad, where he says, you know, uh, yeah, the 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 um, the laws of you know uh, and the prescriptions of a dunya, so the world, the the, the kind of temporal world are one affair and then the laws of the the beyond or what you need to do in order to preserve uh, your soul in a certain state are another set of concerns and and you also have uh uh elements so for example it's uh, attributed to ibn khaldun although i haven't checked this in person but he says for instance ibn khaldun um, uh, says uh, according to to uh, some people at least that the Prophet Muhammad came to teach people uh, prescriptions for uh, salvation so it's a kind of eschatological concern but he didn't come to teach them medicine so that's kind of Ibn Khaldun's critique right of uh, medicine that comes from the Sunnah from, from the Prophet's uh, accounts of the Prophet's doing, uh, doings and sayings where he says well yeah but you know what, what does the Prophet uh, have to do with medicine you know it's it's a completely different field so again there seems to be some room and once you have that room right um uh, then you can question whether um uh, this is uh, an adequate account of uh islamic uh societies to just fo uh, think of them as fixated on the articulation of religious law and the adherence to it and and i mean it does have some consequences so i don't know i mean this this might seem uh uh, problematic or, or maybe I'm just being cantankerous but you know just a text that most of your listeners I think will be familiar with um, 
is Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism. And he has this section on Islam, right, when he's comparing uh, Islam and Christianity, where Robinson's account of Islamic societies is just in terms of the religion. So, for example, when he talks about slavery in Islam, which I think his account is not correct at all, but he says, well, look, uh, you know, in the Islamic world, they didn't really take up Aristotle's uh, account of natural slavery in book one of the politics. That's one of the things that Robinson really talks about uh, a lot when he's comparing uh, the Islamic societies to uh, Western societies. And he says the reason they didn't do that is because of all of these uh, religious prescriptions. Whereas, in fact, the reason they didn't do it is they had no access to Aristotle's politics. So, uh, you know, there is a certain account of Islamic societies as dominated by religion that gets taken up all the way to the 20th century, uh, either by people who are, quote unquote, defending Islamic societies or criticizing them. But in both cases, in my view, this account is inadequate. Uh, and so you can see it in Hegel and you can see it in texts like Cedric Robinson. Uh, and, and Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism of, is, of course, concerned with an emancipatory project in a way that uh, Hegel is not, right? They're totally different texts. But my point is the same. St you know, you can see the, the, the carryover of certain ideas. Yeah, one of the things I remember from Cedric Robinson talking about Islam that I always had some difficulty with in terms of a formulation was he also sort of proposes i think i have this right i hope i'm not misquoting him but my understanding of it is that he sort of proposes that um islam doesn't hold the capacity um to develop syncretic forms right and so like part of his argument is this is about i know i'm going on a crazy tangent i just want to make this point quickly but part of his argument is that you know, among, um, you know, slave ships, uh, slave quarters, maroon societies, right? The part of what happens, right, is people don't have the same language, they don't have the same religious systems, right? And so that there's some syncretic practices that go on, right? And so this can also pose in, in if we look at historical accounts, for instance, of say, Nat Turner or Harriet Tubman, where people read them as only operating within Christian ideas uh, of certain things. And if you read their work carefully, their writing and, and people who wrote about them, I think it's quite clear that there's also African spiritual practices or African re religions that are infused in there, right? And, you know, other people, um, I think Michael Gomez has written a book that kind of goes into some of these um, details, right? But anyways, I mean, I think even within the Haitian revolution, there's always been this debate about, uh, about Bukman and whether he was, um, uh, a Muslim, right. Which some people would argue that, and other people would argue that, uh, you know, he, he wasn't, you know, and that this was, uh, voodoo, voodoo basically. Um, you know, but anyways, that's, I think that anyway, it's an interesting thing because I think it's just sort of posed about Islam again, that it doesn't have this, it's again, this supposition that islam doesn't have this capacity for room or expansion or interacting with other um, religious views spiritual practices um you know and obviously there's a lot of different versions of islam in the world as well too right so that i think should pose some problems with that formulation as well right yeah i mean i think i think the way you posed it is is really Again, it's it's a kind of restatement of Hegel's point about Islam, right? The people who say, well, you know, if if uh, you know, and you know, the people who say that somebody like Bookman, for example, could not be, uh, uh, you know, Muslim or something, uh, because he drew on other traditions. Because again, the uh, supposition here is Islam involves this kind of abstract conception of uh, uh, God, that means that really anything pre-existing, you know, uh, uh, in front of the adherent to this religion has to be demolished. Whereas it doesn't seem to be historically the case, it would also make it very hard to explain the expansion of Islam, right? I mean, how, how would you, uh, even if you conquer people, right, even if you militarily defeat people, they have, you know, traditions, they have economic interests, they have social mores and so on that you cannot just come and wipe them, wipe these uh, mores and pre-existing customs and work with a blank slate. So I think actually that debate you're referencing is very relevant to the Hegel stuff. And you can see uh, maybe some people who still hold the kind of Hegelian image of Islam have a hard time making sense of that stuff. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um...
I mean, I would argue in the United States context, actually, too, that like if you look at like the Nation of Islam and you look at the the Moorish Temple, you look at kind of this history of African variants then of Islam, too. Right. That, again, this poses problems with for that idea, because I think a lot of times this is it's it's sort of people sort of don't want to deal with, well, what is the origin of those things? Right. And and don't want to trace it back to the fact that there were African enslaved folks who came to the United States who were Muslim. Right. And so the, those practices would have been present from the beginning, but would also sort of, you know, form and morph over time and be, you know, handed down, you know. So anyways, um, interesting discussion. So. Um, so you look at uh, one of the things you do is you look at two non-European examinations of Hegel and Islam. And again, this kind of ties to your I don't I shouldn't say your overall practice, your practice in the work that I've engaged with of yours, um, you know, in part when we did our discussion about East African Marxism, like one of the things you said was, you know, it's not adequate from your point of view merely to look at you know, Marxist philosophy within Europe and say, is this Eurocentric or, you know, is the is there racist conceptions within this or whatever? Like it also has to you have to engage with how Marxism is taken up, you know, in Latin America, in Africa, in, you know, the, in Asia, it's and so on um, to, you know, to to get a fuller view and a fuller discussion of of, you know, the the tools of these philosophies, I guess you could say. Um, and um, so you state a similar motivation and looking at these discussions of Hegel that you choose. I hope I don't, please correct my mispronunciations on these, Mohammed al Khost and Mahmoud Haider, or Haider, um, as two thinkers to look at. Um, so say a little bit about kind of what you found within their work. I thought this was a very interesting aspect of the piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Muhammad al Khost is actually, I mean, he's, I mean, so there's stuff that I, I didn't make it to the final version. So, you know, this is maybe an opportunity for me to, to talk about it. Uh, I mean, so with respect to that practice that you're referring to earlier, I mean, I think you're totally right. I mean, you figured out my, my ploy. So maybe I, I should make less appearances, you know, so, so that it's, uh, people don't get bored. But no, I mean, I, I think this question of really, Okay, so one response to the Orientalist thing that Hegel says is to kind of, uh, so something that some Hegel scholars do at least is to engage in some uh, some form of apologetics. Well, you know, he didn't have access to the material, he, he, which I mean, we show in the paper that he definitely had access to a lot of material, um, uh, which I mean, this, this response when people say, well, at that time, people didn't know any better or anything like that is uh, is usually nonsensical because people haven't examined the context. Uh, I don't really know how they arrive at this view. But the other response is to say, well, yeah, I mean, he did say these things which are bad. Uh, and to also, you know, so, so and then there is a question of, well, what do you do with that stuff? You could try to um, do a kind of navel gazing exercise where you know, it's Europeans kind of spilling out their guilty conscious, uh, conscience or something, which I frankly don't care about at all. I mean, I don't really care about that stuff. I don't really care about people's, you know, kind of internal struggles. You know, it's not my thing. Or you could actually look at how people who uh, try to use this stuff for a certain project dealt with these elements that are Orientalist or racist or as the case may be, which I think is more fruitful anyway because it moves us away from this kind of tribunal mode where it's you know we're pronouncing him guilty or not guilty which you know is again a very strange project because i personally don't care about hegel as a person at all i mean i don't know him i don't really have any emotional attachment to him i couldn't care less in that sense uh, but i do care about some of his ideas i find them interesting and so on uh, and potentially useful for certain uh, uh, intellectual uh, and political projects um so, so that's that's kind of my my entry point in in uh, in these debates. Um, uh, so, so with respect to uh, the two people we picked, so El, -El is, is is very interesting because he's kind of a political figure in Egypt. He's he's the president of Cairo University, a massive institution, and he has been tasked. Uh, again, I don't really say this in the paper because we don't have space. Uh, he has been tasked in the aftermath of. 2013 to kind of develop an intellectual project uh, for religious reform that's not secular in character. 
right? So it's supposed to be a project to counter the dominance of Islamist thought. And by that, I mean uh, uh, the ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood, the ideas of Salafist groups and so on, which have been, you know, uh, hegemonic in Egypt, at least since the 1970s, uh, as an alternative to either Arab socialism with Nasser or to Marxism. So, and it was fostered uh, uh, as a as uh, um, a counter to these currents by, you know, Sadat and so on. Uh, uh, and of course, it's not just a question of policy. There is, you know, this question about, uh, you know, social developments in, in Egypt and the relationship between these and what happens, for example, in the Gulf, people going to work in the Gulf anyway. But so he has been tasked with this kind of, reform project um so he finds hegel and allies and this is what i find interesting uh is that he finds that hegel could be an ally because hegel is somebody who criticizes both islam uh but you know Khush doesn't definitely doesn't want to criticize islam he basically takes what hegel says about islam and applies it to uh the ideas of the islamists so he says yeah there is a form of islam that's fanatical uh there is a form of islam that's uh intolerant of pre-existing social mores and uh, intellectual currents. So, for example, that's people's, uh, you know, that's an adequate account of Wahhabism. What Hegel says about, you know, Islam is actually perhaps true of a uh, one current, right? One one, one uh, current uh, uh, in that religion. Um, so he's kind of transferring that critique from Islam to you know, his political opponent. So I thought that was a very interesting deployment of Hegel. But Hegel is, is appealing to him also because Hegel is very critical of uh, uh, Enlightenment philosophy, specifically some of its materialist currents, which again, he thinks of as, you know, having this uh, uh, abstract intellectualist account of uh social change where you have just a set of norms and then you measure existing reality against them and if it doesn't measure up then you should do your best to do away with it so hegel as an idealist thinks that this kind of philosophical thinking contributed to uh not just the french revolution which he was a big fan of but revolutionary terror which he was not a big fan of um uh, so hegel uh, you know talks about you know um, islam as being fanatical but also the proponents of uh, or uh, the people behind the revolutionary the revolutionary terror in France as also being fanatical in that sense. Um, so uh, Al Khush finds that okay, there is this key intellectual figure uh, in the philosophical discourse of modernity, to use kind of Habermas's term, who is critical of these materialist currents and who I could use against. Uh, the Islamists, and that's why he turns to him. So I, you know, so so that's kind of the really interesting maneuver that happens. Now, the other thing he does is he says, well, actually, it's not that Hegel is wrong that there are determinate religions, and then there is a kind of series that terminates in a consummate religion. But then, as you know, as somebody, you know, uh, Al Khost, as somebody who's a Muslim and who's tasked to develop this reform project that's critical of some forms of religiosity but is not secular, I think that's very important, uh, to uh, to then say, well, actually, it's Islam that's the consummate religion, not Protestant Christianity. So, so you can see the kind of trick that's happening, which, again, I think is very interesting to think about how these uh, ideas travel and then get redeployed in a specific context. Uh, and I think the reason that these elements become salient uh, in his account of Hegel, I think also has to be explained, you know, in terms of like political uh, uh, po political functions uh, and so on. So that's that's for him. I mean, uh, Mahmoud Haider is less well known. He's he's you know I think more of just an intellectual, uh, 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 more of a, just a you know f regular philosopher who doesn't have you know some political authority or anything. Uh, but he's also involved in this project. So uh, so there is this. Uh, journal in Arabic, uh, it's called the Istagrab. So, Istagrab is a very interesting word, it, it means occidentalism. So, it's supposed to be well, just as there is Orientalism, the study of the Orient in Western uh, universities, well, let's have Occidentalism in 
Middle Eastern uh, 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 or Arab uh, institutions of research and higher education. So he's part of that project, and I think his 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 response to Hegel is uh, is derived from Al Al Khost's response uh, to uh, to Hegel, but it's a bit different because he says, well, actually, maybe. Uh, the fundamental problem here is that Hegel wants to assume some kind of cultural purity, which he doesn't even have the right to, according to his own conception of purity. So Hegel has this account of purity in the science of logic, where he tries to show that actually purity is impossible. And that has very interesting implications for how we think about interactions between different cultures and so on. Much appreciated. Um... Yeah, so I'm going to open up to questions in the chat if folks have them. Um, and uh, unless there's anything concluding that you want to say in that discussion of, of you know, Hegel in that piece and, and Islam. Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, I mean, the thing I would uh, draw attention to is, uh, I mean, one interesting question, which I think people, you know, we can think about, I don't, we don't really speak about it explicitly in, in the paper, but there is this question of whether, can you come up with a kind of, uh, to bring it back to the Edward Said discussion. Now, this is a form of Orientalism, but, you know, is it possible to come up with a kind of historical materialist account of Orientalism for somebody like Hegel? Because one common criticism of Said is people say, well, he didn't even look at German Orientalist writings. Um, and they say the reason he didn't do that, because that's not connected to any specific imperialist interest. And so far as Germany didn't have a strong imperialist presence in the Middle East. I mean, they did, you know, in terms of the, the, the railway projects they did with the Ottoman Empire, but not like Britain, not like France. So there is a question of whether that model of explanation could apply in that case. And one thing to think about is whether Hegel thought of himself as German at all. I think he's really more interested in a kind of European identity. And in that sense, you could connect it to some objective material interests having to do with conquest. So that's just some kind of uh, attempt to connect the two elements. Right on. So yeah, Yipper, uh, Hegel, yeah, is a German philosopher, uh, very influential um, on Western philosophy as a whole, but also part of my interest in it too is because, and maybe we should say a little bit, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, if there is, if you have any, um, of because he's he's influential on Marx to quite a degree. However, Marx is critical also of of Hegel, right? And so it's like it's a you know, and and some people also kind of pose whether some of the problems within Marxism come from problems within Hegel and so on. And so yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I know the piece is really looking at Hegel, but if you have any thoughts on relevancy to Marxism. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a massive question. So I'll just, I mean, I do have some some thoughts, but I'll try to be uh, uh, brief. Um, I mean, of course, you know, there is a sense in which there is also uh, an image of Hegel that uh, perhaps is not quite accurate uh, in some Marxist circles. So there's this idea that Hegel just explains everything in terms of uh, um, ideas and uh, adequacy and inadequacy uh, at that level. But, you know, even in Hegel's history of philosophy, there are these, you know, proto-historical materialist moments. So, for example, he explains Stoicism as a movement in Hellenistic philosophy and then uh, in Roman philosophy as a kind of response to uh, uh, the social reality created by uh, the creation of large empires. So, uh, of course, Alexander's empire and then uh, uh, um, uh, it's breaking up by his successors and then the Roman Empire and then he's saying look well if you had a model of the good life that uh, was centered on communal participation communal direct political participation well that thing is kind of gone at that point uh, you're all subordinated to uh, a king who rules over a large territory so uh, it becomes so he thinks of stoicism as a kind of intellectual response to a condition of political defeat um, and in that, you know, to that extent, there are these moments, right, in Hegel. So I don't want to say that this is a general model because it's not, but but I think there is, you know, a misconception about Hegel. But you, if you emphasize these kind of moments in Hegel, then you could see, well, maybe there is some line of continuity between Hegel and Marx. Uh, 
But of course, I think there are very important lines of discontinuity. Marx just doesn't think that history proceeds in terms of uh, um, the unfolding of spirit or uh, uh, or geist. So, uh, so I think it's you know I I think it's it's a bit hard again to say that you know there are these problems with Marxism because of the Hegelian influence or lack thereof. Uh, uh, I mean, it would take you know an hour to more than an hour to to go about this in any serious way right but right on yeah um so i wanted to raise a quick you know this is not a question a comment from francis um this was about edward said and talking about you know making this distinction i guess between also literary theory i guess broadly and comparative literature um you know meaning discussing the objects of analysis, uh, which I guess would also connect back to what you were talking about a little bit with terms of correspondence theory, maybe, I don't know where, I'm out of my depth. Um, this is why and how it works, his works are uptaken by different audiences, what enchants them. Um, I don't know if you have any response to that, but I appreciate your comment, Francis. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I agree with Francis, of course, you know, we have to have a theory of why people, uh, in totally different contexts, right? Take up a text written in a, con a context that's kind of alien to them, why they find it interesting. Uh, and I think, you know, at the level of kind of, if we're talking about Orientalist ideology, for instance, um, as ideology in a kind of pejorative sense, uh, there is a question of, you know, why do people accept certain uh, misrepresentations given that the evidence that the, that's accessible to them um, uh, doesn't really compel them to accept these misrepresentations. So do we give an account of this in terms of social interest, in terms of a kind of general cognitive bias that's untethered to a specific social location? So I think all of these are very, excuse me, interesting questions for sure. Yeah, right on. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is a question kind of for both of us uh, to elaborate on the role of motivation in advancing imperialism and resistance um how our needs like having stable jobs are weaponized to motivate us to be complicit i mean you know again this is a big question i think a couple of things that i would say up front is like you know one of the reasons that capitalism is a uh such a difficult system to grapple with is that it does make it you know it it does require you to work in order to to live in order to sustain yourself and so um you know that that is one of the challenges is just it's really actually just a simple function of time in some ways of like how much time do people have to get together to socially organize to determine to um you know to to engage in a sort of revolutionary project if they are you know working so much Obviously, the, the flip side of that discussion also, though, if you think about Marx, is that uh, the workplace is uh, definitely a potential site of struggle and um, a site of, you know, unionization, a site of striking, a site where um, you can actually have um, an impact on the capitalist system and its ability to reproduce itself as well. And so, um, you know, there is a there there is a a thing there i think in terms of motivations um you know again that gets you know that gets tricky because you get into the question i mean i think i'm more materialist oriented and so i do tend to think that um you know the sort of economic and political and the way that they the the, the way that our society structured in terms of social relations um you know has a lot to do with what motivates and demotivates us um, but I also do, and I'm very interested in, um, how people are motivated by ideas and spirituality in particular. Um, and I don't, I don't discount it, you know, in some kind of, um, you know, vulgar way, because I think if you look at the history of struggle, um, there's a lot of different aspects of it to look at, you know, often we see revolutions happen in the places where capitalism is actually, least strong as opposed to strongest right which gives people more time and more space and also their needs are less met by the system and so therefore they have more 
of a possibility to perhaps do something new. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people do become motivated in these movements um, by by religious movements as well, right? And so there is, um, you know, a question of 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 primacy and and what what's driving things for sure in that question. But um, you know, those are some of the difficult, I think, discussions within that. I don't know if you have thoughts, Ziad. Yeah, I mean that's that's uh I mean it's a very interesting question because I mean we've been talking, you know, in this this episode we've just been talking about ideology and so on. But even once you go past that level, so let's say you previously at some po point in time accepted a certain account, you no longer accept it, you realize well this is just not really in my interest and it's not true also. But then the question becomes well there is a whole set of disincentives that makes it the case that there are very high transaction costs for taking certain forms of action. So you could be, you know, not convinced, but you know that you have to think that your boss, uh, or sorry, act as if you believe that your boss is a genius, uh, even though you obviously don't believe it. And there's no evidence that, you know, that points in that direction. But because if you don't, you know, maybe your boss is the kind of person who's, uh, you know, a megalomaniac and would fire you or would make your life difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there is a very kind of sustained, interesting account of this. And uh, Olufemi Tai was elite capture. I don't know if you guys have had him on uh, on the show or talked about. Yeah, but but he gives an account yeah. in these terms, uh, right? So, so so we haven't even touched that part. Uh, but I mean, with the question of motivation, I think. You know, it's it's very interesting because we've been talking about interests and objective interests and so on. But as a matter of fact, of course, uh, you know, you cannot just articulate uh, or sorry, give an account of social and political movements in terms of interests. Um, because you could say that, you know, as an individual worker participating in either a strike or maybe some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, more kind of uh, explicitly illegal form of political activity, some revolutionary political activity, your short-term short objective interests are in danger, right? You're endangering them because, you know, uh, even if this movement succeeds, it might not succeed during your lifetime. You might die in the process and so on. So it can't be the case that the account of motivation is just in terms of interests. Nobody sits and calculates, you know, what I'm going to do based on this calculation. Uh, but you could say that the kind of historical materialist account gives uh, an account of motivation in terms of the bonds that are also established between people who, as you said, uh, Jared, who are working uh, together in a specific place um, where, you know, there becomes this kind of tight knit bond of solidarity uh, just through being together and working towards specific goals that can go beyond just calculations of interest. Um, uh, so, so there is that aspect. I mean, one very interesting account of that debate. So, if I can give it a shout out, uh, it's not a well-known book, but uh, Richard Miller's analyzing uh, Marxism came out in eighty-three or eighty-two. Uh, I mean, I really recommend that book. It's kind of boring analytic philosophy, but really has as one of its core questions the question uh, uh, that I think Neder. Uh, sorry, I, I don't see the name in the ticker anymore. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. Yeah, uh, that that Nether was posing. So uh, that's just you know a recommendation. Right on, thank you. Um, so this is a question, you know, or a comment that maybe we could talk about just a little bit. Is the the caliphates were the classical philosopher stewards during the Western Dark Ages, Middle Ages, if I remember this correctly. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's interesting in part about Hegel's like sort of dismissal of Islam also is that there is all this scientific and philosophical work that comes out of the Islamic world um, that is accessible, you know, that it, that, it, that exists, is in this, exists in this time. And so to sort of um, you know, in some ways, a dismissal of Islam is also becomes a dismissal of um, a whole bunch of philosophical and scientific and mathematical, you know, work that that was done. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, so with Hegel, it's interesting because he doesn't deny that there was uh, this kind of reception of ancient Greek philosophy, uh, a translation movement, and then an attempt to make it cohere with uh, Islam. But he thinks that's the only thing that happened. 
that it was a kind of so uh, uh, that uh, uh, I'm gonna say it in Arabic and then try to translate it because so uh, that during the Al Khalifa Al Abbasiyah the Abbasid Caliphate yeah, yeah I think that's the transliteration right uh, um, that there was this movement to translate and preserve ancient Greek philosophy but then that the Muslim philosophers and uh, Christian Arabic philosophers, a lot of them were Christian, of course, didn't do anything with it. Uh, so, again, it's kind of a model whereby, yeah, you know, Islam has this role uh, in terms of preserving uh, ancient Greek philosophical texts, but only so that they could go to Europe and then be used properly, as it were, or be subjected to adequate critique, which is not really, of course, what happened uh, in fact, you know, some key developments in the history of Islamic philosophy. So Ibn Sina moves quite far away, for, ex for example, from uh, Aristotelian philosophy uh, and from Ibn, you know, so so and from so, so he's quite different from somebody like Ibn Rajd, for instance, who is this very important commentator on Aristotle, of course. Right on. Well, I, that's it as far as audience questions that I captured. And that's it for my questions as well. It was great to be in conversation with you again, man. I continue to follow your work and I'm sure that we'll we'll do it again. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you want to say in closing. Um, I will say, yeah, you'd reference the pieces. So um, I will get from you that response that was written um, by Brennan. Um, but the other papers are available in the show description so people can um, access them through your Phil Papers page, um, which has a whole bunch of great stuff and um, including the the um, the papers that we talked about when we had our discussion of East African Marxism. So if people haven't checked that out, that's a very I found that a very interesting discussion as well. So anyway, thank you again, Ziad. Thank you so much for having me and uh, thank you for everybody who uh, tuned in and who uh, sent questions. Much appreciated. Thanks for the great questions, Jared. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time.